This is my first book and I call it a visual story book, not an illustrated story book. To talk about this book, which is so very close to my heart and will remain so even if I later do other books, is actually a process of self-exploration. It's like going inside to understand the incompletions within myself. Once we as academics embrace this profession, which is so very demanding, there is much that is wiped out. Writing articles, publishing them, researching archives for different understanding and forever continuing with the dialectics of point of views, newer understandings of others' texts. This is enticing too and has a magic web of its own. And I guess I was part of this game till, should I say, 2016? One of my stories included in the Shivalite book was written and published in Muse India way back in 2009. As a kind of a Freudian slip, perhaps, in the daily routine of an academic. Later, it was selected for the Short Story Festival by Shaitya Academy in Gantok in 2015. My conscious engagement with brushes, music and writing began in 2016. It was like retracing my roots. Born and brought up and educated in metropolises like Calcutta and Delhi, I had almost lost touch with the best and the intermittent phases of life and living in the Chhatnagpur hills where every day brought with it a bouquet of undefinable gladness, peace and harmony. This was my grandma's place in Lohadaga. The blue hills, the songs of the Odao people, their dances in the full moon night during Sarul Utsav, their songs on their return from day's work down the hills, the scattered eucalyptus forests, the Shankho River, in numerous waterfalls here and there, stories of lives of ordinary men and women. All of this was part of my childhood and adolescent years. Academia, honestly, had for some time completely crushed this life which I had lived and I guess cherished inwardly, always, unconsciously, though I floated with the tide. My mother was a student of Ram Kinkar Baich, the sculptor and painter in Shantiniketan. She was also a student of Syed Mustaba Ali, the great storyteller I had met in my life in Shantiniketan when I was only, say, five. My entry into the world of storytelling began with him as he would rock me in his lap and tell me the tales in Tuntuni storybook rhythmically and I would imitate him exactly and we would laugh together till tears streamed down his cheeks in pure joy. Budi jatche atar mathata thak thak kore nortche. Budi jatche atar mathata thak thak kore nortche. Sweet memories these, along with my mother's lovely batik paintings and oils, which would make me watch her creative frenzy in pure awe and wonder. All of these have gone into the story Shivalite unconsciously. My university job in Sikkim, my exposure to nature once again after a long time, had awakened the sleeping self within me which contained the storehouse of memories of my past life, my submerged life, as I call it. Most of my weekends in my years of stay there were spent roaming the Himalayas. Some of my friends in Sizure know this, and I had the good fortune of sharing a bit of my Himalayan love with them when they visited me. The storm in midnight, the vision that I write about and paint in Shivalite is real. There would be such sudden storms with flashes of lightning and there would be mother beats mingling with the roaring thunder as a divine trumpet. And these would make visions happen. I was reading the creation myths of Sikkim at that time 
and learning Thangka paintings from a Tibetan Thangka painter there. While an academic in me could easily sense the cultural syncretism that has taken place in the figure of Kala Chakra, the visionary part in me wanted to paint this reality. Vajra Yogini, the Dakini Shakti, came to life with the thunder on the hilltops so visible and so real from my fifth floor flat in the night with a panoramic view of the Himalayas. The vision coalesced with the vision of a Robindra Shungit I grew up with. Vajra Manik Diye Gatha, Ashar Tomar Mala. To translate it roughly, your garland of monsoon flowers are strung with beads of lightning. My ailing mother, my inability to come home, my visit to the Kamaksha hills to pray for her release to the divinity have all forced their way into the story, Shivalite dedicated to her. Here's a clip from the YouTube which contains my visual storytelling of Shivalite. She gave me her sun-warming smiles, her flowers, her thoughts in rhyme, her past woven in darkness and shine, her future which was mine. She gave me all she had, like that tree shedding its blossoms before they turned weary in time. The gory locks of the mountain god was spread across the blanket of dim stars in the fading night. You could hear him dancing to the rhythm of the madal and machunga echoing in the hills. His eyes were wine red, his lips half parted in ecstasy. The pines and conifers tips swayed to the rhythm of the Dumfu beats. If you were new to this world of the mountain kingdom, you would wake up to the sound of the Madal beats suddenly in those wee hours. You would find then that the shades of thinning night, weaving shadows of shameful light and delight. But the final blast of Shivalite cracking through the misty mirror, all would be gone. The music, the gory lux of the mountain god in his dance, the color chakra's uncanny eyes opening in a wide grin, which seemed to say, Oh, there you are, I've caught you in the act the maiden yielding to the embrace of a lover in rapturous desire, her eyes half cast in shame and uncontrollable longing, his arms lustily clasping to his breast the loveliness in her prime. All, all would vanish into thin air. A shaft of light greeted Devi the moment she opened her eyes. She wanted to hold on to the remnants of her dream fondly. The dancing rhythm, the music of the beats, the festival sarangi still rang in her ears. There were streaks of lightning against the bluish black backdrop. The thundering steps raked up a cloud of dust right before the sky was splashed with blood, with her feet bleeding. The, the powerful, powerful figure of the feminine masculine, she was the father, he was the mother, the single parent of the brother and sister. Yet it 
was time to get up. It was time to wake up to the world of light crackling with the carousing birds, a world bellowing a cock a doodle do mobile alarm from somewhere. The story, as one of my readers, my teacher in Calcutta University, Professor Thaputi Gupto, has analyzed, has many layers to it, and it moves between various time periods. I have used the Sikkimese creation myth and laced it with Devi's story, which is partly autobiographical and partly fictional, as all stories are. Music is interlaced with narrative. The Nepali folk song by Aruna Lama has the same tune of an Otul Prashadi number which a Bengali familiar with his or her culture knows. Akamur Ganet Tori Bhashi Thilam Noyun Jale And music, tunes, always trigger memories, visions of other realities more real than the reality of life itself. So, when I shared my story with my musician friends and kin, they readily agreed to collaborate with me for the visual storytelling on YouTube. So much for my first visual story. Himalayan hills come into my later stories too, like Naika and Mandaravas. Won't talk much about them, for I really want my friends to read the book for themselves. The book is now available on Kindle worldwide and the hard copy published by Indiana on Amazon.in for Indian readers. I feel happy if friends would read and review the book. I was very scared to place this book in the hands of my academic friends, some turned into writers and poets too, for my fear of facing their sharp criticism. I entrusted the draft to my close friend, of college and university years, Shukti, and to Anirban, for he understands my semiotic love for music as a close friend and whose music inspires my creativity. Only when the book took final shape, I asked Professor Thaputi Gupta, my teacher in Calcutta University, to read and review before sending it to print. Thaputi Gupta is a painter too and married to a musician, so I guess I could trust her to understand me and not negate me. Last but not the least, creativity lives for itself. No matter what jabs might come one's way, no matter what condescension might come one's way, or appreciation too, inspiration is as spontaneous as the rain showers on the hills, though carving it in words and images through brushes and pen need expertise matched with creative frenzy. I'm learning learning the art of expression and hoping for more confidence in me to paint the semiotic images which force their way out of me before they form syllables and utterances in a text. I'd like to read two brief excerpts from Naika before Sornaval begins the discussion. The first excerpt from Naika. Moina had worn a red sari with yellow border, a red bindi, after her morning shower. She could feel Mahesh's gaze on her as she carried on her domestic chores. Sometimes their eyes met and a smile of understanding sparkled like a fresh morning dew between them. A woman did not need any ornaments to enhance her beauty when love itself adorned her with loveliness and grace. Mahesh too looked and felt younger. It was a homecoming for him after a long exile. It was going to be three in the afternoon and time for Schumann to come home from school. How surprised he would be to see his Baba home. Moina's phone was ringing. Mahesh had picked up the phone. Moina, it's me. Had to call you. Do you know that you danced like Urvashi last night? Why did you hide this talent from me? Tell me. Shuman never mentioned this either. Moina, are you there? He always spoke in a rush, but this time his voice was thick with unmistakable excitement and emotion. Mohish silently passed on the phone to Moina, who was tending to the newly blossomed bell flowers in the balcony. Who is it? 
she had asked unmindfully. Someone whom you know surely was his clipped reply. She took the phone from him, a bit surprised. Hello? Silence followed for some time. Hello? Who is it? This time, there was a response. Moina, could we meet today? I mean, could you come out for a while, right now? I'm right here, waiting for you, near the pawn shop. Surely you don't mind a kappa today? He had laughed. Moina's hands had started shaking. No, it was not nervousness. It was anger and irritation. She had disconnected the line. The silver-grey altar was waiting like the last time, parked right below her balcony. Mohish too had been looking that way, and he had turned around to meet her gaze. Her eyes had wanted to say, No, this is not true, no. She found herself shaking her head, but Mohish had pushed her aside gently and left the balcony. The phone was ringing again. She knew that next it would be the doorbell. And so it was. She had stood there like a dead log, holding on to the door of the balcony. It was Shumon hammering at the door. Ma, Ma, his voice had the tinge of the previous night's tension. Moina had opened the door. Right behind Shumon, Pritam stood there shamelessly smiling with a wink in his eyes. Moina had stepped back in a state of stupor. She had frantically looked around for Mohesh. Mohesh? Mohesh? Where was he? The second excerpt from the same story. The twinkling lights in the hills were going out one by one as the night stretched on. The sound of water from the Joras was more distinct with darkness deepening gradually. It was time that Moina went indoors. She was not really hungry. The snacks that she had eaten with Onida, her colleague at MG Mark, were pretty heavy. Just a glass of warm milk with some brandy would work fine, she thought. As she sank into her pillow later in the night and closed her eyes, she could sense strangeness. There was a rhythm rising from the deep it was at low key but unmistakable. It was like the beats of the mridang in slow rhythm. Dha tha then ta katta ka then ta tete katta gadi kene dha. There was someone dancing. A flute was playing somewhere. The beats gathered momentum with the variations of the teka. A strange yet mild sandalwood perfume was slowly enveloping the room. She tried to see through the hazy light and shade. A tall black figure with slender waist and hair up to his shoulders was gracefully dancing. <laughs>